Howdy folks, Craig Levati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bone Zoomcast. This week we're talking to Jorge Plata. He is a paleo lab technician in, well, the museum's paleo lab. He's a part of the new next generation of paleontologists. The future's bright, folks. Hey folks, Craig Lovati here at the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bone Zoomcast. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Kat Havens. Howdy, howdy. How are you guys? I'm good. I see you were showing off some cookies a minute ago. My my shortbread cookies, my Walker shortbread cookies. I'm very excited. So apparently the show is now sponsored by a British uh, cookie company. Yeah. So there we go. We do need show sponsors, don't we? Like, like all good <laughs> podcast zoom cast whatever you call it we need like a like me undies or some other weird company that's out there like or today's uh, podcast is sponsored by squarespace the or noon or <laughs> the com app or i don't know the other weird men's health ones that i are all Ooh. on the podcast that i listen to anyway uh today folks we are joined by a rising star at the museum if i must say so Jorge Plata from the Paleo Lab down in the Paleontology Hall. How are you doing, Jorge? Hi, Craig. I'm doing great. Thanks uh, for having me on the show. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day of chiseling dirt off of fossils for, for our audiences down there and learning all you can uh, to talk to us for, for a few minutes on Beyond Bones. Uh, I was really excited to learn more about you after seeing all of your... Um, all of your TikTok appearances. As you guys yes. know, if you follow the museum on TikTok and you should, uh, it is spectacular. It is masterful. It is hilarious. Um, I love it so much. And Jorge is a part of it a lot. You always sort of play the, uh, I don't know to say like the, almost the zookeeper for Herman, our, uh, our inflatable dinosaur, uh, <laughs> creature that runs around the museum and generally gets into all sorts of strange curb your enthusiasm style mischief. And I was just really excited. And also too, you know, um, you were part of this really cool little gang down there in the paleo lab with, uh, David Temple and Chuck Leah. And it's just a lot of fun. And you guys have a lot of fun down there and it's always exciting to see a younger person down there learning the ropes. And, uh, it's the next generation of the museum down there. Not old, like Dave and Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. Not like old and young and and hopeful. Yeah. Medically iffy, you know, (laughs) that kind of thing. Like, or Hey, you seem like a healthy kid. Yep. Uh, I like to joke around that they got me so I can lift all the heavy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or you're like the, you're the body donor. You're like the organ donor. Like if somebody needs something oh, down there. Craig, that's dark. That's like, I don't my, know. that's like cat level dark. That is cat I'm level impressed. dark. Well, I'm learning. I'm learning. Good, good. So, so tell us the story, how you came to be behind the window over there in the paleo lab. Well, I initially started working at the museum when I was like a teenager, like 17 how long ago was that? Um, ooh, that was 2016, probably. Uh, you were a teenager in 2016. Okay. Well, I was turning <sighs> 18 that year. So I was like, I'm still a teenager at 18. I would consider it. Yeah, like you are. To adulthood. Mm-hmm. So I started on the floor taking tickets, uh, working venues. And I did that for about two years. And I saw a position open up for being a concierge or tour guide. So I applied to it. I mean, I love, I love teaching. I love talking to people. So it was like the perfect job for me. I did that for about two, almost two years. And then this position opened up the paleontology lab technician. I was like, finally my chance. Yeah. It's like, I've been obsessed with dinosaurs since like, I can remember my mom thought it was just a phase. I proved her wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I think all mothers think that, right. It's like, yeah. But it's a good phase to be in, right? Like, it's not like it's like something scary or bad. It's like it's dinosaurs. So it's, you know, it's not so bad. There's worse things to be obsessed with. Well, and Jorge, it's just been like the past maybe five years that my parents and brothers have stopped asking me when I'm going to get a real job because somehow the museum isn't like the real world. And now they appreciate it. They understand it better. But I just think it's funny. Anything that, you know, is seems fun and museum oriented almost seems like a dream job 
and maybe it, not real. Yeah. It basically is a dream job. I mean, I get to work alongside the coolest <laughs> beings to ever exist, in my opinion. I mean, my walk to work, I get to walk through the skeletons just to get to the lab. I can't think of a cooler commute than that. And you have the key to get in the door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't even have a key to get in that door. Craig is obsessed with doors, by the way, Jorge. (laughs) His thing when he was a kid is he had to go through all the doors in the museum. He's still working on it. Yeah, like yeah, but no, you have a key to that. Like I have to knock if I want to go in there. So (laughs) like you you've already you've already leveled up. So and and obviously too, it, it seems like just by working the floor at the museum and just, you know, encountering, you know, all of the wildlife that comes through the door, you learn a lot of things. And a lot of our employees, a lot of our, a lot of our folks, you, you guys are like sponges. You're, you're always, you know, ingesting information from all around you. Yeah, that's definitely true. I've learned a lot from other staff members here. Um, cause it's impossible to know everything. So yeah. I love the museum cause it's this community, this like collection of knowledge that everyone can learn something from somebody else. Uh, Hi. just cause I work here doesn't mean I know everything about dinosaurs or paleontology. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the volunteers that put in the years know a little bit more than I do. And you can just sort of overhear conversations and ask questions and everything. And it, uh, it, we are definitely a teaching museum too. And also your story is really cool because we hire from within when we can, mm-hmm. you know, we try to cultivate in-house, We have, you know, our farm teams and, you know, you guys sort of get, you know, people get shot up to the next level and stuff. And it's always really cool to see that. And I don't know personally of many museums or educational groups like we are that have that kind of situation. Yeah, uh, I consider myself very lucky because I think I submitted this application like a day before it closed with the deadline. And it was tough because I think David, which is the associate creator of paleontology for those watching who may not know, um, AKA my boss, <laughs> he, <laughs> he already had his mindset on somebody else. Um, one of his interns who um, he's had for a couple of years. And he's like, he, during the interview, it was him, um, someone from HR and then Lisa Rabori, um, head of collections. He asked me questions that he hadn't asked anybody else. I just can only imagine. Like, just, to, just to stump me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I just answered them because it, this really is a passion of mine. And, you know, okay. he looked a little defeated when I answered them right because it seemed that everybody else was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is definitely our guy. And he's like, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me ask him one more thing. <laughs> So what's what's the day like when you clocked in today? What is a what is a typical day like in the paleo lab for you? Well, um, being the lab technician means that I have a lot of equipment to set up. So first thing I do is I turn on the air compressor. Almost everything in here, you see all these this tubing and ventilation is run by an air compressor. We have an air collection system and we have the pressure system that allows our tools to work. So we have these air scribes. I should have pulled one out, but they basically, they're basically air chisels. They work away at the rock to remove it, to allow us to do fossil preparation. So that is a very important part of the stuff that we do here because I mean, we, were, we work with rock every single day. So that's the first thing I set up. I come in, turn on all the lights. They, we have a window, like it's right in front of me that We flip the switch, we turn on the mic, which people can talk to us through. I put on this headset and the show begins. (laughs) You're in the hamster cage. I like it. Basically, if you guys haven't visited already, and why are you watching this podcast if you haven't? And if you come to the museum, um, you you sort of flip a switch and it it goes from opaque to, to clear. So you can actually see inside the paleo lab. And then you're wearing one of the headsets and you can talk to the uh, various sized individuals that are outside the window. And it's usually little people who are asking you crazy questions about dinosaur bones. Oh, yeah. Um, We've gotten so many of those questions that I've actually had to formulate a frequently (laughs) asked question sheet for the volunteers because so good. um, 
we need these kinds of resources because kids are like at the forefront of dinosaur knowledge. Yeah. Every time there's something new, they know about it. And sometimes we're not as quick to find out. So a, a big part of my job is research. I got to watch all the kids' movies that these kids are watching, the shows. Do you have to watch um, Dinosaur Train? Yes. What is that? Whoa. It's, <laughs> uh, tell them what it is, Jorge. What is Dinosaur Train? So imagine uh, you go back in time okay. to prehistoric times, and then there's this train that can travel <laughs> through a time tunnel, and kids can okay. learn all about different kinds of prehistoric creatures and dinosaurs. Um, it's it's the bomb for that actually yeah. is that on a channel is that on a youtube thing what it's is on that? pbs it's on oh, pbs it's like the it's okay. the cool thing for you know the k through or the pre-k Dinosaur through train. like two set oh yeah it's that's a, a very deal. that's a very uh highly sought after audience to mm -hmm. the the uh born uh five years ago sort yep. of Johnny will World. be into it soon. I suspect watching it over and over. And I have over. a feeling Johnny's kids will always be like 20 years, like ahead of everybody. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm like, very, very well versed in dinosaur train. Yeah. Okay. There you go, Johnny. Good okay. job. Dinosaur. <laughs> that, or has, did he do a good job? Excuse me. Is it, did, did he, he do, do a good, good job? job? Dinosaur train. Is that? Oh the, yeah. He that, got it. He got it down. <laughs> of course <laughs> I did. Ride, I see it every ride, day. Ride, ride. I do love, though, that, that you do have to sort of keep up with current dinosaur pop culture to, to answer these questions. And that, no, that's and that. But that also is a testament to how how much we care about our audience that's coming through those doors, yes. because, uh, you know, if you if you were to go in there and be like, I don't know what dinosaur train is. And then the kid would be like, Mom, let's go to another yeah. dinosaur lab, because this one is apparently not up to snuff. This one so, knows nothing. What are some of the common questions you get while you're working in there? Oh, we get everything from what are you doing to <laughs> what was the biggest or smallest dinosaur? Um, I think the weirdest question. What does I've dinosaur gotten, meat taste like? Chicken or beef? Kid, Texas kids love that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually know the answer to that question. So, Chicken, right? Kind of. Yeah. I love telling kids that like whenever they eat dinosaur chicken nuggets, they're eating actual dinosaurs mm -hmm. and it just blows their mind. <laughs> but my theory is they taste like things. goose. Yeah. Kind of gamey like okay. goose or like a pheasant. Um, they didn't really have that much fat like chickens do. Cause we kind of raise chickens on a farm, live in the easy life. They can accumulate all that fat, mm -hmm. but out in the wild, you know, they have to run for their food or away from predators. So It'd be pretty gamey. I'm actually working on a cookbook uh, for prehistoric recipes. You really oh, do work with idea. David Temple. You really do work with David <laughs> Temple. He's got you I into do. like eating weird bugs now, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, David, I if you guys don't know, Dave cooks bugs. It's don't crazy. take any food from Dave Temple. Oh, no, it's fine. It's it's you got to learn sometime. Mm. It's that first that time. first <laughs> first time when you have, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, Oh God! Uh, it's in your teeth, the um, legs of a cricket. Yeah, cricket legs in your teeth. The chitin. Yeah, then you're like, yeah, I work for the museum. Well, he gave me yep. a donut that he had taken all of the jelly out of, and so I don't take any food from <laughs> Dave Temple anymore. So you got a prehistoric cookbook coming out. Um, hopefully soon. <laughs> I'm basically challenging myself to only use ingredients that were available back then. Okay. That's so going to be hard. It's very hard. Um, Cause grass didn't exist back then. Right. It did not. I just learned that a few weeks ago that grass didn't exist back then. So whenever time somebody draws a portrait or if anything with dinosaurs and they have some grazing grass, that doesn't really, it's not a thing. Yeah. So you kind of have to get creative with these things. One of my favorite recipes is called carboniferous stir fry. So uh, the Carboniferous was a time period where there were just masses of plants just exploding all over. And some of the oldest plants are edible. For example, the fiddleheads of ferns, the little spiral tops when they're sprouting up, you can stir fry them along with horsetails, which is this little plant here, horsetail shoots. And they make a really nice stir fry. So like bamboo shoots? Um, or like not really bamboo shoots. They're more um, think along the lines of a 
uh, green onion or oh. a, um, well, what am I looking for here? A Brussels sprout, uh, a, a similar taste between those two. Okay, I'm interested, now I'm interested. So that's stuff that, that, that I guess herbivores would have been eating back then. Yes. Okay. In fact, that guy back there, you see the, the big millipede behind mm-hmm. me? <sighs> that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> For you? That, 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 just, that was just <laughs> off the charts. That was amazing. We it tastes like lobster? They probably would have. I have I have a really cool image. <laughs> this is actually the image that inspired my cookbook. This artist has like a sea scorpion cooked like a lobster. Ooh. Oh wow! So See, yeah, that's why yeah. I don't eat lobster because they're just big underwater bugs. But they taste good. <laughs> that's what got me off of crawfish. Finally, I haven't had one crawfish in four years. I don't eat them either because uh, it was just it was too much salt, and then also to to your point, cat, it was like ugh. too much underwater. Bug. things happening bottom feeding happening yeah. for my taste yes. so or hey tell us about the interplay between david and chuck i've always been excited <laughs> to, to know about that like it's Give like just, what, that's like that his groupie name chuck and dave chave chave oh, oh like brangela yes, yes okay. pretty much brangelina sorry brangelina. That, that's what i mean brangelina Jeez, benefit. i don't know pop culture or sports ball that's not even pop culture that's like 20 years ago give it the program brangelina <laughs> they made a bunch of kids so this <laughs> chave so are you like the third party now like you're like the the just the i don't know what you want to call it like the handler for chave um not really i'm more of i'm more of like their uh I, I don't even know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm a witness to it all. Oh. Oof, that sounds even or like, more. Or like their illegitimate child. Of that sounds story. troubling, all of it. The witness. I mean, it's like they have their own little cult where mm. they, they've they created. I mean, you know, David has David doll. Yeah, and that's right. Chuck, yeah, it's back behind you somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just staring it, at you. It's like I don't like on it. a shelf. <laughs> you know, whenever well, I did that injured, one year for the museum, we did a David. It was Elf on the. It was David the Elf on a shelf, and he was like around the museum. I even went to Michael's and bought him a little how uh, Christmas costume. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> it was weird. So you're so Chave is sort of this two headed monster inside the paleo lab and you witness everything what have you learned from them i guess like uh, to get serious here for a second what what do you actively learn from them like how how important is that for you to be around them well uh i kind of see them as friends and mentors because they've had more years of experience you know um with everything so anytime i have an issue or i don't know something they're always who i turn to um, in fact, we all sit on a straight line over here. So my station is like right here. Yeah. Chuck's right there. And David's in the corner. So we form like Where he line. belongs. <laughs> and then so, sometimes you have like a volunteer sitting next to, to your left, I guess, working on one of the air scribes too. Yes. So uh, we kind of have like this right angle of workstations. And yeah, every time I have a question that I may not know the answer to, I ask Chuck or David and they're, they're readily there to answer um i love the moments where they always tell me to say like something silly at the window yeah for example um they love to mess with um with the coprolites so coprolite is fossilized poop and then he makes me ask them ask them if they want to touch a real fossil you know i say that and then they go outside and they bring out this big coprolite and then Mm -hmm. He makes him touch it. And then Chuck loves saying, like, my dog made that this morning. <sighs> we we really have just no quarter at the museum, man. Like, we are vicious. We are just vicious, vicious. We love you all, but we're very vicious. We will Can- we'll hand you million of poops that, that's million of years old and we'll we'll ruin a child's experience for life. Or they'll be like, I went to the I went to H M S guys, I had a great time. But uh, at the end, I had to hold a piece of poop from uh, four million years ago. I would not recommend that. <laughs> I mean, 
the most unsightly thing is that it looks like it's fresh, but it doesn't yeah. feel that way, nor does it smell that way. Yeah, yeah. But kids, a bit also too, there was, there's always probably, and you were probably, I'm assuming, one of those special kids back in the day that you were like, oh, I want to know more about that and mm-hmm. the animal that left that there. Did you grow up in Houston? I did all my life. The sad so you- part was, I didn't get to go to this museum till I was a teenager. I actually organized a school trip through my principal just so I could go here. Aww. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Where did you go to high school? I went to Ailey Facings High School. Um, I'm very familiar the, with that. Yeah. So Beyonce went to the school next to mine called Elsa. Elsa, yeah. yep. Sure did. It's not too far away from where I grew up. So, so you were sort of close to the Sugarland Museum, right? Yeah, I'm actually okay. smack dab in the middle of both museums. Mm-hmm. So okay. um, either way, it's a long way. My parents <laughs> didn't really have the time to really take me to the museum. So I'm like, I'm going to find my own way. So I went straight to the principal and I said, hey, you know, it'll be a really nice field trip. Very <laughs> educational and stuff. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I love that. A teenager being motivated enough to go to the principal to set up a field trip. And that's the story, too. We've heard that story so many times. You know, some of our guests here, you know, that are obviously that work for us, that have been here for a long time. They have a similar story where they were little and, you know, mm-hmm. they came here for years, you know, and then all of a sudden they're, you know, opening doors with their little badge and everything. And they have a key to the paleo lab. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a special key to all the, the hidden drawers, which, um, you know, Greg's getting have, excited. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> no, we have it's fine. I don't need those keys. So are they still um, working on baby Neo next door? The, um, the baby Demetrodon, there's a, in that one that separate room over there i know they're still work do you know about the work on that jacket still um we've actually finished with the jacket it's more of doing the individual prep on the bones oh, so wow. let me give you like a little visual example so okay. um we've cleaned all the bones for the jacket so they're all exposed okay. the next step um after you know cataloging every, everything both digitally and uh on paper what we're going to do is we're going to remove the bones and individually prep them. So by that, you basically remove it, clean it all up, make sure it's just the bone. Nice vertebrae. Yeah. Yes. Um, this actually took 300 hours of a volunteer working on it. So this is, um, wow. This is this small. Can you imagine a jacket that's the size of a table? There's a lot like, of people working on that. Mm-hmm. And those air scribes too, are they all using the air ones or are they, or are they using ones that without the, without the power? By hand. Them? Yeah. By hand. So we use a lot of hand tools once we get to the, mm-hmm. the jackets. For example, okay. We use things like this. Yeah. Um, tungsten tip needles or uh, carbide steel. And other times we go down with just these little detailed Q-tips, mm-hmm. anything to be as delicate as we can. And if something breaks, well, we have the best glues for the job. Um, Fine act. Like these, yeah, we melt these plastic pellets in acetone, and that helps consolidate the bone from falling apart. So that's, it also uh, sticks really nicely to your fingers. I, I'm aware. Oh yeah. It's very satisfying peeling the glue away. <laughs> is there is there a big, and you're, how old are you now? You're 22, 23? I am 23. Okay. Is there... Uh, we're obviously not in any sort of danger of losing any the generations coming up behind us about dinosaurs, right? We're not mm-hmm. we're not in danger of losing dinosaur obsessives, right? Nope. There is lots of people my age that um, I've I've met online through the pandemic that are working a similar job, or they're just highly motivated. Um, self-starters with paleo like this is there is actually a community of people my age out there that obsess about this stuff and um some are even at the <laughs> forefront of like new discoveries and technology that's awesome that's it's, it's it's so cool to see like future generations sort of piling up behind it and sort of you know you know that it's safe i guess yes you're not going to be having to convert anybody in a few years dinosaurs always have a built-in it's almost in our dna in a sense for us to be just, you know, wowed and just interested in these things that, that existed so long before us. Yeah. I mean, 
I cannot describe the feeling of going on your first dig and seeing just the fossil in the ground. Like it feels like you found treasure. Yeah. And odds are you're one of the first people to have ever laid eyes on that. Yeah. That was my thing on the, on the digs that I've been on was like, I was like, no, this has not like likely even felt air in millions of years. I'm the first person who's seen this since it ever. And it makes you think just how lucky you are as a person too, that like, you know, through millions of years of time, you're the waiting one for me. you're you're the organism that was you know that had the intelligence and the eyeballs and all the senses to be able to look at it you know it's sort of it's 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 and sort of all of these things that had to happen for yeah. me to get there to find yes. it. it it is i'm getting spiritual i'm taking your your you're spot, taking my right? role now yeah i am <laughs> that's, sorry that's usually my gig you know i'm the one that gets metaphysical on here and starts <laughs> burning incense and stuff so or hey, what is coming up for you professionally? What's what's around the corner? So um, I plan to get an, an advanced degree in paleontology. My ultimate goal is to be a curator because I love the museum environment um, and the education part of it because the future generation is what's going to keep this going, like you said. Mm -hmm. So that is something I'm going to go to school for. This is like a great place to really cultivate my knowledge and experience. So I'm I feel very lucky and honestly, it's one of the best jobs I've ever had. <laughs> very cool. We love hearing that. And I was so excited to talk to you, especially from just, you know, our brief moments, you know, hanging out in the Paleo Lab and obviously watching you on TikTok, everything you do with Mike, just really cool stuff. And I'm really excited we got to talk to you. And uh, what are we keeping you from right now? What are you what are you working on right now? Oh, so today on Wednesday, the lab's actually closed. So there's no one here. Um, that's why I was able to make time and be here to do the zoom. Um, I actually requested, uh, to be able to do the zoom here because I thought the backdrop. Yeah, was that's nice. very cool. Really nice. I had to double check and make sure with David and Chuck that it was okay. Yeah. They, I, they I need also, to know. They were. <laughs> and make sure they're not there to be a distraction because yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah. I did text them to see, are y'all coming back from like lunch in here? Cause Typically, they, they, they have like some uh, some interesting entrance. Like we have these knocks that we do. Um, so David would have like this song that will never stop until you open the door. Oh, so it's like, uh, <laughs> oh my so, God. Hey guys, then, just a reminder, I'm doing the Zoom. And then Chuck is as a musician, and we'll get to that eventually on the show again. But and Chuck's probably out front with a guitar that was like made in like the 1800s, like, you know, jamming on a song. God bless you for what you do, or Hey, thank you very much for dealing with that. And I'm excited. The paleo lab is in good hands for this foreseeable future until a big museum swallows you up and takes you away from us. But this is a big museum. I think well, y'all already swallowed me up. A bigger yeah, that's museum. True. That is true. That is true. I mean, one day you're going to be talking to me from the Smithsonian or something, and you have your own reality show and all these things. And <laughs> I just, like that idea, a reality show. That's, there you go. The Paleo Lab could be a reality show. Quite honestly, it could. Totally could be. It could. Or, hey, thank you very much. Uh, when can, I was going to ask, acting like you're a comedian in there. Uh, when can people see you inside the Paleo Lab? <laughs> well, if you guys come anytime between Thursday and Sunday, I will be here from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. All right. And uh, do you guys accept tips? Um, yes, we do. Actually, there we go. They need a tip jar over there. We need a tip jar. Oh, no, he's going to show us something. We're going to get a tip jar out front over there. So people who work on the so shift at least pay for a coffee. Donation box to save the trilobites. Aww. Aww. So if you love trilobites, these little guys that actually made a TikTok about I like to nickname them the roly polies of the sea. Um, it's the oh, same. That's a fancy one. Yes, that's got a white earth mustache. Is that a 3D printed one? It is a 3D yeah. printed one. So that's another thing that I do that I forgot to mention. We so have a 3D printer they, right there, right? Yeah, right next yeah. to me. So we can make cool stuff like this baby T-Rex cool. job. And um, part of my job is making the models, printing them, and make them go, go together. Back. Yep. So I painted this one. So this is a life-size juvenile T-Rex. That is awesome. And when, when you start out, it looks like this. So 
That's um, pretty nice. Were you there that afternoon? I just like walked in randomly and I was like, I need the T-Rex jaw, right? You were in there. Yes, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I walked in there because the um some of they were doing a job fair and they had a table in the uh the grand hall and Mm -hmm. there was just like balloons and a stuffed dinosaur down there, and they were like Craig, nobody's over here. Nobody wants to get a job application. I'm like, give me one minute. So then I grabbed somebody. We went down to the paleo lab and I was like, give me the dinosaur jaw. Give me the T-Rex jaw. The big one that's like heavy. It looks like a guitar. And I was like, let's do this. And like, I'm walking through the halls. You don't feel as cool ever as if you're, as when you're walking through the hall of the museum with a T-Rex jaw and it was like 30 pounds. It's a heavy mm-hmm. thing. So I'm like, you know, walking around, you know, like, and like, you feel like a rock star. You feel like you're, feel like you're carrying like the world series trophy or something. Cause kids are like, Oh my God, he's got a thing. And we use that for the job fair. And I'm pretty sure that's why we have all these extra applicants now, because they were like, I want to work with that T-Rex jaw. And so, now they come to the lab and say, I want your job. I, yeah. That's yes. what you got to watch out for. Yes. Yes. Hey, I can't get it off my mind until it okay. comes out of my mouth. You know how I am, Craig. Yes. What are we saving the trilobites from? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, it, I think it was a fun started because the trilobites that we have out on display, uh, a lot of them have this thing called pyrite rot. So uh, it basically means when, there's iron pyrite in a fossil it tends oh, to spread right the oxidation throughout the fossil so yep. it kind of deteriorates them and we need like a special care for those trilobites okay. i mean they're already all extinct there's not saving them from extinction you're saving them you're saving the specimens for future generations yes yeah I believe that's that's why the fun was started um <laughs> that happens to our meteorite too there's some sort of it, it, it is the, the rock deteriorates it's not meant crazy. to be here it's not meant to be here it is too no it's meant it, to yeah. be it's, it's from space it belongs in a museum it belongs in a museum that's just where we all belong because we're weirdos i belong to the museum yes yeah right now am i an artifact or am i a specimen <laughs> specimen what's the difference artifact or specimen artifact is something made or changed by human hands Okay. The specimen is something gathered, I guess, that is tip, typifies whatever group it's from. I mean, I have been modified by human hands. So you totally have. Technically, like, I am hardcore. an artifact. You're an artifact. I'm an artifact. All right. Speaking of artifacts, we got to jet off so Orhe can do his thing. Thank you so much for logging in with us today. Thank you so much. And it was so cool to talk to you. And this is probably, hopefully, one of just the first of many conversations on here. Thanks, Jorge. Anytime. I'll Hide that to... Dave doll. Hide that Dave doll so his cost spirit can't find yeah, it. Yeah, it's bad luck. Bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will. All right. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.